Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Resurrection Lutheran Church on this first Sunday in Lent. May our worship today be glorifying to God and a blessing to you. Amen. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We now pause for a moment to reflect on our sins and the forgiveness we're promised in Jesus. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you, and also with you. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 13th chapter. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our sermon text for today comes from the Gospel of John, as just read. A little later in this morning's message, I will reference a scene written by a different John, quoting a line from one of John Hughes' films. For those of you who don't know who that is, John Hughes was a writer and director from the Midwest who wrote some of the most beloved movies of the 80s and early 90s, almost all of which take place and were filmed in the suburbs of Chicago, where he grew up, in only about 30 minutes from where I grew up. So needless to say, I've watched them many times in my life, and in doing so, I've noticed four reoccurring themes, which I will borrow for this sermon, as we recount our own reunion story and Christ's journey to bring us to God, that we may be with him. The first theme is a story of emotional division, illustrated by the physical separation of loved ones, usually while traveling. The second is self-centered characters who desire independence, but after quiet reflection, realize the loneliness of their selfishness and long for companionship. The third is a key scene where two main characters sorrowfully lock eyes in repentance. And the fourth is a heartwarming conclusion, usually in the foyer of the house right inside the front door, of physical reunion and emotional reconciliation. Granted, the relationships in these stories vary greatly. Sometimes it's entire families, like in all the vacation movies, or students and friends in The Breakfast Club, husband and wife and she's having a baby, or mother and daughter in Uncle Buck. You've got total strangers in Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, and brothers-in-law for The Great Outdoors, father and daughter for Sixteen Candles, mother and son in Home Alone, brother and sister in Phaeus Bueller, next-door neighbors in Dennis the Menace, and even a man and his dog in Beethoven. That's a lot of connections. And though the relationships of the stories may vary, the message of their importance does not. Now please note that the rating system worked very differently in the 80s, so not all of these films are family-friendly. But they are all about friends and family, and the importance of being together in the end. And ultimately, that is why they still resonate with so many people to this day. John Hughes' movies had a profound understanding of the human condition 
and that's why we can relate to them. Stories of the brokenness of humanity, difficulty of adolescence, tragedy of loneliness, necessity of relationships and family, and the ever-present hope of redemption and reconciliation between those divided upon reuniting will always speak to us as human beings because it is written within us. We as humans instinctively seek out community and when relationships break, we strive to mend them. Why? Because all of our earthly connections were instituted by God to serve as a reflection of our relationship with Him. We as human beings were created by God to be with God. And this is the most important relationship we shall ever be in, which is why we as a congregation will be spending this entire week through the Red Letter Challenge reflecting on the importance of being with Jesus, who on the cross has saved us from the lonely independence of our sin and death and reunited us to the family of our Heavenly Father by His forgiveness. But of course, every relationship has its problems, and because of sin, ours with God began in separation. As it says in Isaiah chapter 59, Behold, your Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you. And in chapter 53, We all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, whenever a relationship is broken off, the first question we usually ask is, who's at fault? Was it his or hers? Did he stray or did she take off? Or did they mutually part because of unreconcilable differences? Well, when it comes to our relationship with the Father, there's no mystery here. The fault is ours. Just from these verses, four truths are made abundantly clear. One, we became separated from God. Two, this division was caused by our sins. We're the ones that left him. Three, the Lord was betrayed, is able and willing to reunite us. And four, he saves our relationship and reunites us by laying the iniquity of our unfaithfulness on Jesus. So clearly, the problem lies with us. But much like in our earthly relationships, we're also pretty good at ignoring this or even passing the buck. But that trick doesn't work with God. In all our earthly relationships, whether romantic, social, professional, or familial, there's always a chance that both sides are at least partly at fault, because all people are flawed, but God is not. The Lord is perfect and selfless. Thus, the only self-centered character in this story is us. We departed from His blessed presence, because we in our pride and sin desired independence, and thought that on our own we could find greater happiness without Him. After all, that was the sin of Adam in the Garden of Eden. By ignoring his father's word and straying from his law and guidance, he was running away from home to love himself and seek his own happiness. That was the sin of the first man and woman, as well as every man and woman since. And the result of this sinful and selfish independence outside of God's presence is always the same, eventual loneliness in life and the eternal separation of death and hell. Now as we read in Isaiah, the Lord is able and willing to take us back, but like any relationship, this can only occur when we honestly and quietly reflect, recognize our selfish behavior, and repent. Otherwise we have not truly humbled ourselves and cannot truly love and be reconciled in forgiveness. Thus at times, since repentance isn't pleasant for us, we may choose to deceive ourselves, deny our sin, and continue to pledge our faithfulness to a life of independence. But ultimately, there is no fulfillment in it, and the reality of loneliness sets in. In the John Hughes movie Uncle Buck, John Candy's character is the typical lovable screw-up. He's charismatic and funny, and he's also lazy, has unhealthy habits, bowls all night, sleeps all day, has been engaged for a decade, lives in a crummy apartment next to the Wrigley Stadium station, and gambles for a living. But he's happy, because he likes his bachelor lifestyle, and he keeps golf clubs in his car, and cherishes his independence. But when his sister-in-law's father has a heart attack, and they can't find a house sitter, his brother reluctantly calls up Buck, and asks him to watch the kids for a couple of weeks. In short, reconnecting and being with a family starts to change him. And towards the end, 
During a quiet night alone after the kids are in bed, he starts reflecting out loud to the dog, or really to himself. And he says, you know, people used to say to me, Buck, you're one lucky son of a gun. You got him made, Buck. And I did. They'd say, man, look at you. You don't have any kids, any wife. You don't have a desk or an office. You don't have a boss to worry about. And they were right. I had it made. The only thing is now, nobody says that anymore. The very next morning, as he's sitting in the driveway, and the two youngest kids are already in the back seat, he has a crisis, deciding whether to drive to the dog track to bet on a sure thing and be set for the whole year, or try to find his bratty teenage niece who just ran away from him. He sides with his old ways and starts to drive his own way towards the track. Then he sees his face in the rearview mirror and hits the brakes. He reflects and turns back to look at the kids and he chooses family over his independence. And the movie ends with him talking to his girlfriend about one day getting married and having kids. When it comes to earthly relationships, devout and intentional independence eventually leads to selfishness, bitterness, and loneliness, whereas faithful and selfish companionship leads to the blessings of love and family, like the peace and certainty that accompanies being intimately known and knowing your own, belonging to a faithful community of comforting that shares in both your joy and suffering, and patiently bearing, cherishing, and sharing in the very thing that holds it all together. Endless, undeserved forgiveness, mercy, and love. The same is true spiritually. We are free to choose our independence over God's invitation to discipleship. We can pledge our devotion to ourselves. But God's word in 2 Timothy chapter 3 describes the result of this lonely life without him. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasing, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions. Being alone, apart from God our Heavenly Father, leads to a lonely and troublesome life on earth, an eternal separation from God in hell after death. Thus, much like the Lord's wisdom in Eden for establishing marriage, we must realize it is not good for man to be alone, because on our own, our selfish instincts and sinfulness can consume us. We succumb to squalor and loneliness, living off crumbs like orphaned bums, reckless bachelors and helpless bastards, without a home and no hope. But this is not who the Heavenly Father created us to be. And so he sent his son to seek and save the lost, that we may be with him, reunited to his family. And our Lord would mend this relationship for us with the most beautiful twist and surprise ending, more amazing than any moving movie. And this scene begins in this Sunday's text. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me. So now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Throughout the Gospels, and especially during our last sermon series on following Jesus, we constantly heard Jesus saying, Come, follow, abide calling us to become his disciples and be with him at all times. After all, Jesus came to reunite through love and reconcile our relationship with God. So naturally, Jesus speaks of the very thing that holds his family together, love, and gives this command to all members. Now, in giving this command to love one another, Jesus was not erasing the Ten Commandments or simply replacing them with just this one for us to attempt to keep and once again try our hand at independent righteousness. And that's a relief, because even this command of loving we cannot keep perfectly, especially without Christ's presence and forgiveness. Thus Jesus did not come to abolish the law, but to keep it for us, that we may abide in him. 
which means that he would have to trade places with us, taking our sin and loneliness and giving us his holiness and communion with God, meaning in order to win for us reconciliation, he would have to be abandoned. In order for his disciples to follow him, he would have to leave them and go off on his own, somewhere they could not come, but he alone must go. The cross. Now Judas had already left Jesus' presence by the time that he said this at the Last Supper, but in the verses after our text, Jesus further tells his loyal disciples that they too will soon desert him. Still, they follow him to the Garden of Gethsemane, and there before Jesus was arrested, he said something heartbreaking to his followers. My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And why did he ask this? Because in his divinity, he knew that unimaginable suffering and loneliness was approaching, and in his humanity, he was desperate for the comforting company of his closest friends, whom he loved dearly. This truth cannot be forgotten. The only begotten Son of God was also born of a woman. Jesus was no stranger to human fear and suffering. With this understanding, Jesus must have wanted to savor every last moment he could, being with them, before he would fulfill his loving role as Savior by his crucifixion. Jesus wanted to be with them there in the garden, because where he was going, they could not come. Our Savior's journey to the cross was a lonely one. Every step of the way, he watched more and more of his loved ones turn and run, one by one, falling away from him, until they were all gone. Despite Jesus' plea, his followers could not stay awake, and his closest friends fell asleep on him in his time of need. Then Judas betrayed him. The disciples dispersed and deserted him. The teachers spoke against him, his students turned on him, the crowds disowned him, and Pilate washed his hands of him. But as we see in Luke chapter 22, there was one who continued to stay with Jesus on his walk toward the cross, at least for a little while. Peter followed at a distance to the courtyard. Then a servant girl seeing him and looking closely at him said, This man was also with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly, this man also was with him. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Finally, even his beloved Peter, who swore on his life just hours before that he would never leave him and always be with him even unto death, denied being with him and even knowing him three times. And in this key scene, Jesus sorrowfully looked right at Peter. They both locked eyes and their hearts both broke. Then Peter left him and wept bitterly. That stare they shared, those reflective tears, that divisive moment must have been one of the loneliest events of Jesus' life, but it wouldn't be the most. It was not yet the climax of Jesus' abandonment, for there was one still with him that too soon would leave him, his father. On the cross, the Son of God would have to become a forgotten, forsaken, friendless orphan to bring about our divine reunion with God. He needed to be entirely alone, and he was. Because through Christ, our spiritual story has a heartwarming conclusion of reunion and reconciliation, and it's recorded in Ephesians chapter 2. You were at one time separated from Christ, alienated, strangers, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross. So you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. And there we have it. It is finished. 
The loneliness of our relationship troubles have been mended by the love of Jesus. There, forsaken on the lonely cross, Christ found us for the Father, bound us to himself, and vowed to us his eternal forgiveness and love. In his death, Jesus pledged his undying devotion to us. As his disciples, he has then called us to turn from our sinful independence in repentance, and thus trust in the hope and home of his forgiveness and companionship. Thus, he welcomes us to follow in his loving footsteps, that we may abide in his merciful presence forever. As sinful beings, we cannot be truly loving without believing in Jesus, and by his mercy being with him. We must abide in him, because apart from him, we can do nothing. Ultimately, we cannot follow our command as disciples to love perfectly, but Jesus mercifully fulfilled it flawlessly on the cross. He loved us so that we may love him, and in his love, love our neighbors, thus following him and showing our love for God. The love of God is the blood of Jesus, and the passion of Christ is evidence of his faithful commitment to us. Consider this. If Jesus willingly endured the inconceivable agony of the cross, is there anything in existence that he wouldn't do just to be with you? Certainly not. You mean everything to him, and if you believe in him, he will never leave you. In fact, he has promised that he is with you always, even to the end of the age. In the coming weeks of Lent, by participating in the Red Letter Challenge, we will be called to some difficult tasks and loving, including forgiving, serving, giving, and going. On our own, as sinful men and women, these are impossible. So we must begin this intimidating journey with Jesus, intentionally and intimately being with him, hearing his word, sharing our hearts with him in prayer, and seeking his presence of body and blood in the Lord's Supper, together in communion with his family of followers. Maybe now more than ever, it is important for us to remember that we are not having an affair with God. This world is not our provider, and our fallen leaders are not our father. We ought to enjoy the earth, but we must not love her more than our Savior. For our home is elsewhere, and our love belongs solely to God and to each other. Thus fueled by the joy of our heartwarming reunion, we can strive to be with him at every opportunity and make Jesus our priority because the key to being a follower of Jesus is trusting in his presence. Believe in him, and you shall surely be with him for all eternity. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all
give an answer But this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom We now join in confessing our faith together by reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. If you have not already done so this week, I would like to encourage you to reflect upon your tithes and offerings to the Lord. If you would like to mail in your tithes or offerings, you may do so to the mailing address that is on the screen. If you would like to give your tithes or offerings online, you may do so on our website, Simply go to the website rlc.life and click the Give Online button. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.